On this episode of the Bravery Academy, I talk with Josh van Kylenberg. Josh is a musician, podcaster, and a family guy. And you may have heard his voice in one of Australia's top podcasts, The Imperfects. Hosted alongside his brother Hugh and his friend Ryan Sheldon, they have taken mental health podcasts to a higher level. And it is my privilege to have this very much imperfect chat with this epic human, Josh van Kylenberg. Welcome, Josh, to the Bravery Academy. I'm really excited because I haven't mentioned this. Actually, I'm a bit of a fan girl, not just of the imperfects. It's going to sound <laughs> like a bit of a stalker, but my friends had actually were so excited to hear that you guys could be coming on to the Bravery Academy because they were the six seats that I think you sold for the New Zealand show that you were going to be oh, no. And they were going to go. Oh, I'm so oh, sorry. No, do not worry because they will like they'll come to Australia for you. So I just had to say they were like so excited to hear that we're going to be coming in and hearing more about your story. Oh um, well, I'm I'm honoured to be here and honoured to be asked. Not many people ask me to come on their podcast, so it's exciting. <laughs> well, they should be because I think there's a lot to get to know. Uh, and <laughs> we'll see. One, we'll see. So for people that don't know you, one of the reasons that I first found out about the the beautiful work that you do and is from the podcast, The Imperfects. Uh, I'm obviously from the other side of the the ditch in New Zealand, but this has been, from what I can see, a, f- a phenomenon in Australia, the imperfects, now at top 0.1% of podcast creators. And wow. did you not know that? Said that? I didn't I didn't know it was said. I haven't heard it said like that. That's a very exclusive number. It's it is. very exciting. It's yeah. very cool. Yeah. I'm only at 0.5 with my first podcast. So I'm pretty oh, it won't like, take won't take long. Oh, I might be. <laughs> It's a bit of a crazy podcast, that one. So it's very different from what we're doing here. But okay. I really have always been in, in awe of the work that you do. And oh. I think one of the reasons why I really wanted to have you on here was your music. So I guess this is going to be something that kind of is a bit not what you're expecting. Yeah. But there was something that really stuck with me when you released your music video. And it must be, how many months ago is that now? It would have been October last year. So I'm not good, as you know, being late for this recording myself today. I'm not good with numbers and times, but I'm going to guess seven months, six, yeah. six months, seven months, about that. Yeah. So I looked at the video of your brother and O'Brien watching the, 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 for the first time. And I had tears watching them. So I was straight away going, what is this? I have to watch this. And my daughter sat beside me, and if, for people that haven't heard of Josh's beautiful music, We Were Here is the song, and I sat down and watched the video. So I really think people need to watch the video, because that is just an outstanding storytelling and beauty, all with the music. Oh, and I'm not trying you. to fangirl you again, but it was just one of those moments where I was like, oh, this is really powerful and beautiful. And it's one of the reasons why I want to dig deeper into how you yeah. got there in the first place. Absolutely. Let's go for it. I just, I'm just curious, had you heard the song before seeing the video or was it that the first time you, oh, cool. I think yeah. that's probably the better way to experience it. I think so too. So we'll make yeah. sure I put that in the show notes so people can go oh, awesome. straight away there. <laughs> so Great. tell me about where you, where did you grow up? Where's, where's your lifestyle? Um, I grew up in uh, Bourne, in, which is a suburb of Eastern Melbourne, kind of leafy green. I think there's a, a song by the, oh, what are they called? It's a, it's almost a piss take of a song by The Clash, but it's by the Skyhooks Australian band called Ball and Calling, which is about kind of how boring it is. <laughs> so it was beautiful. I absolutely loved it. But it, to give you an indication, it was sort of it's in this weird pocket of Melbourne that was uh, in about the 1920s, I think had a really highly religious group of people founding the suburb. And so it's actually a dry suburb. So there's no pubs or no license or there wasn't when i was growing up no like restaurant it was byo restaurants and no bottle shops or anything like that oh there were bottle shops sorry but no licensed venues and so as a like growing up it was a really safe green warm lovely environment and a really happy early childhood uh but it was frustrating when i went eight turned 18 and wanted to go to pubs and you had to drive like or get a cab like three suburbs to get to a pub so yeah it, it meant cab fares were a bit expensive when i didn't have much money <laughs> and what was life like with a brother like you? So if you, if you want to have a listen to the Imperfects, mm. obviously there is you, there is Hugh, your brother, and then yeah. there's Ryan as well in there. But you've yeah. obviously, Hugh's the older brother, is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So Hugh, there's three of three siblings. Ryan's not one of the siblings, to 
<laughs> um, there's uh, older brother Hugh, who's six years older than me, and then a sister Georgia, who's three years older than me, in the middle. And I was the luckiest little brother around. I think I had two older siblings who I, I think it's okay. To, this doesn't sound arrogant. I don't think, but they just adored me. They were so warm and loving and caring. And ch- childhood was. I, I have no like. We're we're an odd family in that I can't remember ever having an argument, either physical or even verbal, with either of my siblings in my whole life. Mm-hmm. And certainly not growing up. I threw a tennis ball at Hugh a bit hard once and hit him in the back and he got annoyed at me. And that is basically the peak peak of conflict as kids. We actually grew up in this house that was like a really long, really big block. The woman who owned before us was an Olympic swimmer in the 30s and she had like a lap pool put in the back. So we had this abnormally large like 20 meter, 15, 20 meter long lap pool in our backyard. So my memories of growing up are basically summer around, in and around that pool, playing games and all sorts of things and just so much, so much fun, so much happiness. You share so much in the podcast though where it didn't always feel happy in regards to later in life and the challenges that you went through. So was yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's all kind of pre-teen years. So teen years is where it got a bit tough. So my sister was diagnosed with an eating disorder in her teenage years. And as uh, anyone who's had any kind of um, mental ill health like that visit the family and has a um, has a huge gravitational pull on the entire family. And so from there on, it was a bit of a, because I was, so I, I'm, I'm going to get these dates wrong because I think as you probably know, the way trauma and all that kind of stuff works, it gets very muddy with timing. But I think I was probably about 11 or 12 of when she was diagnosed, or at least when things were serious, but that could be around about that time. So I was sort of transitioning into what's, um, oh, how would you say it, slightly challenging time in your life regardless when you're yeah. going into high school, going through puberty, all that kind of stuff, but then also having the added layer of us as a family trying to navigate something that was terrifying and really sad, uh, sad and understatement. It was really tragic. Going through that on top of just going through puberty and teenage years was challenging. So I, I think my self-identity started to go on a bit of a skewed path from there. And how did that skew? Which way did it go? Well, for me, I, I tried to make everyone feel like everything's okay. I think we all did really. Like Georgia is church is the most resilient tough toughest person i think i've ever met and so she was battling a terrible mental illness by well not by herself but she was de- she was dealing it with it in the best way she could and uh hugh was trying to make everyone laugh and keep everyone happy uh, and i was trying to be perfect really and make sure that i got perfect marks never did anything wrong at school we do started a live show we uh, that we've been touring around the country. We do these tea house cards that we've got on our podcast. And I pulled one the other day in a live show where I found myself telling this story about being a, a teenager and that I got threatened with a detention once. And I got looked so upset that they like reject, they, they returned. They, they were, uh, what's the word? They pulled it off. They, they pulled it off. They took it back. They took it back. Yeah, they were like, back, oh, sorry, back, mate. Back sorry. They're like, oh, Not God, we can't give this kid a detention. He's too upset. So I kind of tried to be perfect. I was like, I like, again, this isn't bragging. I think this is more just the, to give you an indication of the kind of student I was. I was like a, a middle school captain and at our school, there was like middle school and then senior school breaking up. And it was that middle school captain was pretty good. But what you really wanted was senior school, like the full school captain. And, and I come from a strange family in that my uncle, cousin, dad, nephew now and brother were all school captains and, and so there was this pressure on me to and my sister was middle school captain and there's pressure on me to be like all right I've got to do that and so when I didn't get that it was it was like a failure it was a failure that my friends still sort of tease me about to this day because they know it gets to me but it because of that they're aware of how silly it is to hold on to that kind of thing but for me at the time it was like that was another thing where I have to be perfect to make sure everything's okay and everyone's sort of I guess proud of me to a degree, but also that give a bit of um, bit of a shining light to what was quite a dark time for us. Yeah. So perfectionism was a big 
has been a big thread, which is ironic because when Hugh, I'm pretty, I'm 99% sure it was Hugh that came up with the name of Perfects, but I feel like I should be sure of that before putting it out there in the world. <laughs> Perfectionism, I thought, I, it hadn't occurred to me how much of a strong thread that was in my life because I, I think because I saw how imperfectly I do everything. It was real blind spot on me to not realize that me focusing on all my imperfections all the time is an indication that I've probably a bit of a perfectionist. How did that show up then? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sort of jumping around a bit here because it got in, going more into twenties, but nothing I ever did was really good enough. I, I've talked about this with a few people close to me who think in a similar way, friends and stuff like that. And I think this is common for people who are trying to create stuff that has an element of creativity in that I would work at something this is in my mid twenties now, work at something and create it regardless of the quality of the work, probably have sort of two or three seconds of going, oh, that feels good before all these demons would start jumping in and saying all the things that were wrong with it and why it's not good. And this really negative self, and then it just spirals from there about like, not only is that work good, but you're no good. This is proof that you're not actually creative. You're not never going to make it. You're whatever making it was in my mind then. But you're not one of the talented ones. You're not one of the ones that makes it pretty quickly. So there was a real jump. Being able to separate the work from who I was was impossible for a very, very long time. And that was work in your career. So, you know, leaving school and going to uni, that, that thread just kept coming through all the way through and uh, even now? Yeah, not so much now. It's really, it's gone really now, so for which maybe we can explore why later. Well, I, I don't know if it's ever gone, but I feel like I've got it in a healthy spot now. It was anything creative, so music and work. Music was never really work. And it, it, I mean, it, I guess it sort of is now, but it doesn't really feel like it at all. But it never really was. So it was sort of the creative stuff outside of work and then work itself. Yeah, I, I, I've been lucky that I've had the same partner, Sophie, since I was 20. We met when I was 20, 20, 20 21, but we didn't sort of start seeing each other till I was about 20 three but we've been together since then then and i'm really lucky that now wife and mother of uh, our kids is the most incredible person so i've been really lucky that for the majority of my adult life i've had an incredible relationship yeah. but and really good friends as well but everything outside of that always felt like a bit of a failure so what did you do at university i studied media communications and okay. major in film making and I mean, there's a good example that I went to school with an incredible filmmaker, uh, to uni, so an incredible filmmaker called Kari Chen, who's doing amazing things in Australia at the moment. And uh, a guy called Lewis Hobber, who has been on our podcast, and he's a radio presenter who was one of my best friends at uni. And it was a reasonably difficult in the space of media and film to get into this course. So it had a bit of a alumni of people, like the guys who made the Saw franchise went there a few years earlier. And it was like a, it was sort of like a high-ish achieving, it was a high achieving film degree to a degree, to a degree, so to speak. But on the first lecture we got, the woman who was running the lecture said, well done for getting in, media industry dying, there are no jobs in media, so you're not going to a job anyway, which is the most <laughs> soul destroying start to a career, to a um, career. So I kind of didn't really make the most of uni. I did, I was... It's like a classic uni student in that I partied and drank a lot and had a lot of fun and made good friends and really enjoyed my time. But the, weirdly, the perfectionism completely disappeared once really? I finished school. So I got like, as far as uni work went, like I, it's kind of strange when I think about it now for someone who held onto it so tightly at school. And then afterwards when I was working, it felt like a failure because I wasn't doing mm -hmm. well enough that at uni, I allowed myself a few years of just sort of getting just good enough to pass grades for that. And I got through and passed, but I, it would be a literal, I'm sure, I don't know what it says, but it would be like pass on the certificate and nothing, nothing higher than that. I think it was sort of, I was exhausted from school trying so hard and I was kind of discovered drinking and how much fun I could have. And I think it was me starting to find out who I actually really was through that process. But then it was just, but that failure at uni, failure to take, make the most of that opportunity meant that in hindsight, I would look back and see people like Lewis and Corey, who I spoke about before and many others who have gone on to do great things. I would look at them and go, oh, they made the most of their opportunity and you're a failure for not doing that. Maybe you would be actually successful now if you 
took that seriously sort of thing. It, it's you, easy to, a negative voice is pretty easy for me to find. Yeah. What were you taught about success then growing up? Really good question. I don't really know if I've got a very profound answer. Mum and dad are incredibly supportive and loving. Like mum was never, I was never pushed into being, applying for things like school captains and high achieving stuff. They were, were always very, very good at telling me that I was enough just being myself and I didn't need to do that kind of stuff. So I never really felt like the messaging of perfectionism came from them. However, they do have standards of like that you need to make the most of your opportunities. I think, I, I think the fact that I went to a private school and we were not necessarily well, like we were wealthy and mum and dad were wealthy enough. Like dad was a dentist, mum was a librarian at the private school. So wealthy enough to send their kids there, but that was kind of where the money went and there wasn't a lot left after that, as opposed to kids at those schools who are just so wealthy at beggar's belief. So there, I think with that comes a certain expectation that they're sacrificing a lot for you to be there. So, And it was never said ever, uh, to be clear, and I think that'd probably want to avoid me ever thinking this, but I think you you notice it and and you take it on. And I think you take it on as a sort of thing of pride to a degree as well. Yeah. yeah. So there was a, so success was, I think there was a, there's a realism in my family from my parents that you can't really control the outcome, but you don't waste the opportunity. Yeah. Make sure you work hard and give it your best shot. I think the real fear would have been getting to the end of as I have a recurring dream now, and I'm sure, sure everyone does, of getting to like year 12 exams or whatever and not having done enough study to be ready would have been mortifying and really a disappointment, I think. Yeah. Interesting. I can see my son in this kind of mentality too of that. Sort of oh, really? Proving. Yeah, he's so 13 and worked the butt off and it's, it's very interesting. Yeah. I'm like, he's not, you know, the thought of getting intention for him is also like his nightmare. He's like, oh, this won't happen, mum. And I, I yeah. look at it and I'm like, how do I also let you know that it's okay to have those moments of failure as well? Mm. Because I've definitely failed. I've failed massively in yeah. some big, big public ways. And it's like, okay. well, how do, I, how do I teach him that? So how, what have you learned from, from failure then over the years after that? Oh, that it's really good. Um, <laughs> that it's, uh, it's one of the most important things, I think. And the way that you can frame it and deal with it is, it feels to me like the, one of the most important things to learn in life and something I'm trying to get better at to almost see them as a weirdly as something not something to look forward to because they're always awful when you fail especially yeah. when it's public but it's not all bad like there's some good really really good stuff that can come out of this and growth and learning and, and it's kind of the only way if you do it well the only way you can really have I think think quick big improvement on whatever you're trying to improve in whatever aspect of of life I should probably also add to that the success thing I think was also heavily framed by the fact that my brother and sister were incredibly successful at school and had an identity that was well known. So there was sort of like this thing of like, oh, there's another one of those two coming through. What are you going to be excellent at? Well, yeah, that, they, wasn't there. yeah, heaps. Yeah, so much because they were both in their own and some overlap, but in their own areas. So there was, yeah, like what's going to be your thing? And I think people especially in a school system like that, try and automatically go, are you going to be your sister or are you going to be your brother? Yeah. Uh, so it's very hard to carve out your own path in that, in a world where you've had two big personalities who are very good at what they do ahead of you. So how do you feel like the DC of Josh has come through then in these, in these 30 plus years, you know? Well, I mean, it's been something I've been working on in my own time and probably made a few missteps along the way in getting lost. And there was a beautiful... Just to re it's weird to reference our own show, but it's a guest on our show, Bronte Campbell. I don't know if you I listened to that episode. Yeah, she was brilliant. And she has this incredible analogy where she talks about how, because, just, I mean, exceptional siblings, she's to a whole new degree for anyone that's listening that doesn't know her sister, Kate, is one of the greatest swimmers of all time. So is Bronte, but she just happens to be like the second best behind her sister. I can't remember the exact details, but it's something like at a point in, time the only person that ever swam faster than her in history was her sister and they're best friends and love each other but she was talking about how she has an analogy of going bush bashing and that it's like she's been following her sister bush bashing the whole time and then she had to cut off her own path and start bashing away at her own path 
to find her own way. And that's difficult and challenging. And her sister didn't necessarily notice that she was going off her own path. And that caused for them a bit of confusion of like, why are you no longer right behind me? But it was a necessary step. So I think throughout my 20s, there's a lot of bush bashing and sometimes exciting, always often exciting, but also I I don't know if I could have done it any other way than what I did, but I don't think I felt like myself until for me that I I had kids and had this podcast, those two things. I don't think being a dad changed that for you. Well, I did a lot of work with a psychologist leading up to it and it wasn't leading up to it for the purpose of having kids. It was just because I was in such a low place, I needed Mm -hmm. help. So I saw an incredible psychologist for about six years, I reckon. And I had this amazing session about two or three weeks before my first child was born. That was like quite a profound thing. It was almost like, it felt like we'd been leading up to this for six years. For some people... Well, I know it takes longer to have a bond with your child, but for me, it was like immediate. It was this like light bulb, not light bulb, light, bigger, lightning, <laughs> lightning bolt, <laughs> bigger than a light bulb, <laughs> lightning bolt kind of moment, seeing Charlie for the first time. And I, I can't remember, it probably wasn't right then, but I remember starting to get negative thoughts about myself after the euphoria of having a child wore off and just sort of saying to myself, your child deserves better than this, than a dad that will talk about himself like this because the last thing I want is him to think that. So um, I didn't, sorry, <laughs> it's emotional about it. I didn't want to continue being that because I thought he deserved a better role model and that worked for me. And they're still there sometimes, but I'm able to snap out of it. And I think just the general euphoria of raising a child, it's it's an absolute roller coaster. But the highs are so high that, and I get so many of them that it sort of keeps me feeling pretty great a lot of the time, even if I am on five hours of interrupted sleep like I am right now. Firing all cylinders. So Charlie was yeah. a circuit breaker for those thoughts. Yeah, yeah, Charlie. And I think it's important to talk about the amount of work I did leading up to that as well. But yeah, I think it was a circuit breaker that was a second jolt after that amazing session before the birth. Yeah. I think that's really powerful for men to first all to hear, but for anybody to hear about that fact that you've done so much work stepping into that uh, mm. inquiry, that psychology inquiry of it yourself, that what yeah. did it feel like when you first stepped into that space? Going to a therapist or psychologist? Yeah. Well, I guess I was, I was familiar with the value of them probably earlier than most males in my generation because of what my sister had gone through and she'd seen a psychiatrist and psychologist a lot and we'd had some family psychology sessions so when I was struggling started to struggle at about 19 or 20 I told my parents and they recommended or they I think my someone I knew was seeing a psychiatrist even though I probably didn't need a psychiatrist but it was like bulk build so as a 19 year old I could do it for free so I was like great I'll go there and that was okay and it was an okay window, but he wasn't the right fit for me. And some of the things he said, and now I'm kind of mind blown that he's, that he's what, to be honest, like I'd broken up with my first ever proper girlfriend and wanted to write a letter to her saying basically, thank you. And for the person that I am now, because of you not trying to any agenda, just we probably, cause she lives in, she lives now, I think still, I assume in Perth, so the other side of Australia. So like, I know we'll never see each other again, but just a thank you, basically. Gratitude, though. Uh, yeah, 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 I guess it was before I knew what they were. <laughs> yeah. And I read it to him in a session and his response was, geez, you, you really wear your heart on your sleeve, don't you? And kind of ridicule me. Yeah. But I still send it to her because I was like, even then I'm like, I think you're wrong. I think I need yeah. to send this. So he wasn't right for me. And then I, about four or five years later, I saw another psych who... She was lovely, but again, it just wasn't the right fit. Nothing against her, but just, yeah, person, it just didn't feel right. And then I had my first and only really serious panic attack when I was probably 25. And my brother knew this psychologist and he recommended who he'd known through work, the work he was doing and suggested her because he thought we'd be a good match from a personality basis. And from the moment I met her, it was like, yeah, this is the 
person I need as my psychologist. And it was a really good fit and an amazing six years. And I haven't seen her since. Yeah. And I did do one session after birth, but it was after the birth. But it almost felt we it felt like, oh yeah, I don't think I need we need this anymore. It was a kind of nice session of, yeah, this is done. And I'm really excited that we're going to have because she's extremely by the book and I haven't seen her for four years, it allowed her the freedom to because she's doing incredible work now in Australia and she's gonna do an episode of the podcast with us later in the year. Oh, exciting. Um, so that's coming up. We've recorded it and it was such an amazing chat. And that'll come out later in the year, which is really cool. Yeah, but it's not about me because that would be uh, very unethical. So it's about the work she's doing now in, in resilience and, and helping people. Yeah. Love that. But I also do love when mm. you have episodes and suddenly you're like, well, I don't want to make it about me, but I'm going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'll probably do that too much. <laughs> and then like Ryan's like, no, I don't want to make it about me. Like, That's about off <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I've got it. Yeah. I'm glad you like it, but I was thinking, I've got to stop making it about me. Really do. <laughs> Those are the moments where everybody like leans in and go, what's he going <laughs> to say? What's he going to share? <laughs> what's, oh, the, what's the share going to be? <laughs> yeah. um, what about the music then? Tell me about the music. Because I know you've had bands. You've had two bands mm. and you've sort yeah. of explored that. What yeah. was then the catalyst to actually write and perform your song? So I played music since I was about 12. So during my... Teenage years, the thing I probably enjoyed the most was playing music. I played sport and music, but singing and playing guitar. And then I never really tried to write music. So I've re recently released music, but to r explain why I have to go back in time. So when I was sort of, tw no, it was I older than 20, I was with So, so it must have been 23. We just started dating. She invited me to this party. Actually, she thought it was a fancy dress party. So I dressed up and went along and it wasn't fancy. What did, what did you well, go as? What did you go as? Amazingly, it was a really like hipster art scene, like crowd from like art school. And I kind of went, I can't remember what the theme was, but I went as like a kind of 1950s James Dean kind of rocker thing. And I just thought that was my style. And they were like, oh, it's cool, man. And so I, I kind of got away with one uh, and just blended in. But I had my dad's old leather jacket on that was like a 60s leather jacket jacket and it was an amazing thing with these actually it must have been 70s because it had enormous collars on it anyway i hadn't realized but i had a little notepad in my breast pocket and a notepad had some lyrics that i've been trying to write and i was standing around a fire out the back of this house having a drink and this guy grabbed the notepad out of my pocket just like grabbed it i didn't know anyone at this party except for Soph and one and her friend and he grabbed it and just started reading it going oh what's this and i panicked and I said, I got no idea. This is my mate's jacket and just lied because I was terrified. And he was like, oh, I think this is, I think these are song lyrics. These are amazing. And started like reading them out loud. And then the notepad got passed around the circle and everyone took the piss out of the song that, that I was trying to write. And I was even so trying to cover it up and mortified and that it came to me and I read out my own lyrics, taking the piss out of them to people in the circle. Um, and so from that day on, when I kind of never tried, I, I never really tried to write lyrics again. I, I wrote musical parts in bands that I was in and sort of helped with lyrics a little bit. Like I'd make little suggestions, but I would never, and certainly in the first band, I didn't want to write lyrics. I wrote the instrumental stuff in the second band. Yeah. I helped a little bit with the odd line, but I could never sit down and actually write a song. And it, as I got older and older. It really started to irk me that I was kind of, I was just, yeah, I was kind of <laughs> a minor, minor, tra minorly traumatized by this experience and couldn't sit down and sort of have this writer's block for 12 years, 13 years. And I told this story on the podcast. Uh, and then we were coming up with what we we're going to do for the live show that we've been touring. And one of the guys, either Ryan Hugh or Bridget, I can't remember, said, it would be incredible if we finished the show with you sing, performing a song. And at the time I was like, oh yeah, great. I'll do like Hallelujah by Jeff Buckley or something. And they were like, no, no. The idea is that I think it'd be much more powerful if you felt comfortable writing a song. Wow. And performing it as like an act of vulnerability. And I it was like, that is a really, can I swear? Yeah, fuck yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a really <laughs> fucking good idea. 
And I was, we'd gone away to a house for the weekend to write the show. And I was in such a good mood that I was like, that is so exciting. I think I'm ready. Let's do it. Wow. And my dad now, I've gone through that transition I've talked about before where I'm not as down on myself, not as negative. I want to do this. And then a few months went by. This is probably six months, eight months before we had to perform the show. And I'm like, I'll do it. I'll definitely do it. And then I kind of have a bit of a thing about guitars where I feel like there's a song in a guitar and a musical instrument like it's just a thing that when you pick up well for me when i pick up an instrument i automatically start playing a certain type of music depending on how it feels and how the instrument sounds and so i thought what i need is a new guitar nothing fancy nothing expensive but i want to get like a, a crappy in inverted commas acoustic guitar that's a bit quirky and a bit weird but actually really is full of character and there's a guitar shop about 100 meters from our office and i really the guy jeremy there's a great guy and i went in there and i'm I describing this to him i'm like i just need something and i don't want to spend much like 250 300 bucks max on this guitar something like and i just point on the wall like that one there that was pretty weird and he's like that one is 250 and it's unbelievable it's, it's like weird as anything it's got like a hole in the wrong place it's all broken and imper- it's got to be perfect which is like that's great and he's like, and it sounds brilliant. So I picked it up and it was like smaller than a normal guitar, which I really liked as well. And it was perfect. It was the exact guitar as after. So I bought that, started writing the song. And I was like, I had this routine where I, at night I try and write when the kids are in bed for an hour just to try and get some hours under my belt. Um, mainly music at this point. I still couldn't bring myself to ta- tackle lyrics. And then the guitar got stolen. What? Someone stole it. Yeah. Huh. I left it in the car out the front of our house and someone oh. broke into the car and stole the guitar. Uh, yeah. Did the song so go then, with that or did the new song come through? Well, I think there were other songs that I'd written with that guitar that I think I have recordings of that I might try and turn into something one day. But the, at that point, I was like, oh, no, this is a sign or something. And I <laughs> got a bit down and I just didn't touch it for another few months. And then it was like, is that? like a month out from the show and I hadn't, I didn't have anything. And my wife was like starting to panic because she's much more organized and onto things and get stuff done. I was also feeling bad taking away time for the kids to write a song. It's such an amorphous thing. It takes a lot of time. I was like, I felt guilty just sitting there and coming back and Soph going, so how was it? Me going, I don't know, got nothing. She's like, okay, that's good. I've had the kids for six hours. You got nothing. Yeah. But I was started writing a few lyrics and going back and I read this incredible, there's an incredible podcast with you. Gary Seinfeld and Tim Ferriss, where he talks about writing. And it's one of the best pieces of advice for writing I've ever heard, where you sit down and write for the set period of time that you said you were going to do it, and then shut it and don't look back on anything you've written and tell yourself you're a genius for a day and that everything's amazing and walk around with the feeling that everything you did was great oh my God. and don't look back on it. And then after 24 hours, come back and go through it with your critical brain. And he's like, I'm lucky if I keep 1%. But if I don't give myself 24 hours thinking I'm good, then I'll spend my entire writing life thinking I'm terrible because the critical brain will come in straight away. And it's true that 99% of what you write is no good, but you can't think about yourself 99% of the time as a bad writer or you'll never write, which I thought was amazing advice. So did that. And then it was honestly, it was like two weeks out from the show and I still didn't have anything. And I was like, I've just got to go into the office and stay there. And I actually did it at the podcast table that we record at with, the, with, my, with another guitar and a couple of ideas I had and kind of pulled it together. And I stayed there till like 2 a.m. just trying to do it. And there's a moment where I haven't actually told anyone this. I might have told you and Ryan, but there's a line in the song that I hadn't written and then it hadn't popped in my head and I sung it. As I was playing that part of the song, it just popped into my head and I started like bawling. And the line is this line, uh, one day I'll hold you for the last time. I hope I have something good in your life because you're the best thing in mine. And it like, oh, I just, yeah, I just started crying and bawling. And it was at that point where I'm like, okay, this, I, it was a really out of body experience. And I, sorry, I'm, this is such a rambly story, but there was a point in here where I had written terrible lyrics they're like objectionably not good and i was like looking back at him going these are so shit and i called ryan to talk to him about it because i really respect ryan and for writing obviously he's one of my closest friends but he's also a great writer and he was like that is you've got to put this shit out there to get to the good stuff he's like that's just part of the process so don't go 
be down on yourself. And for me, getting to that one lyric and some other stuff in there as well that I quite like, it was the first time I'd ever pushed through lots of stuff that was, was actually no good and got to the other side where good came out of it. And I realized I saw the full process yeah. and I felt this amazing buzz of confidence of like, oh, you can, if you push through the crap, there is actually good stuff on the other side, but you've just got to not hate yourself enough and just be objectionable and say, okay, the work's not good, but you're okay. You just keep going. That you might come up with something that you're proud of at the end. And at that point, because it meant so much to me and it made me cry, it didn't really matter anymore what other people thought of it. I was like, I'm confident to sing this to someone and perform this because it's a truth within me that represents exactly how I feel. And the feeling came out on the paper. And that's that's kind of that's success. And I really, and to go back on some stuff I said earlier, it's anything past that I can't control. So it can't be really defined as success. So I've got there and this is enough. Yeah. What would it feel like when you listened to it and watched it? Well, that was pretty, the, the, yeah, that was pretty good. I mean, Hugh had heard the song at that point. I'll never forget the first time I played the song to the guys. So I didn't play any of it to them until it was actually pretty, pretty, pretty ballsy come to think of it, but. We had our first show to like a thousand people in Geelong on the Saturday night. We had two shows back to back and we had rehearsals that week and no one had heard the song. Oh my God. Until Wednesday of the, that week. And we had a rehearsal booked and I think even Bridge and Ryan, even though they were keeping it very cool, they're like, it's okay. It'll come when it's ready. Cause I think that happened on like, it was less than 10 days, I think before the first show that I got that song, that moment. And so they were like, full confidence, it'll happen. Don't worry. We're not pushing you. But I think on the inside, they'd be like going, oh shit, we're going to have to rewrite the end of the show. And then we had a full rehearsal on the Wednesday, which we'd done heaps. And we got to that point of the show where I played the song and I was like, I think I'm going to play it. I'm ready to play it. And they're like, yes, so I played it. And Hugh bawled the first time he heard it. And I'll never forget watching him over in the corner of my playing it for the first time and him properly falling uh and that was a pretty incredible moment and pretty special yeah and then the, the film clip thing that you're referring to is equally as special but in a different way it, it, he was crying about different things yeah at that point as we've talked about afterwards the thought i think does he say this on the episode did he say this afterwards i can't remember but the thought process for him and that was as you'll first see the film clip not one give much away was the thought what of me being gone and him still alive one day was that that might that the possibility that I might get old and die and he will and he will still be alive, which could happen, might not, but that's what really it sort of struck him that that was a chance of happening. Yeah, that's kept come through in some of the conversations. And obviously, it sounds like I'm very much an imperfect fan, but I could hear that in moments where. You have interviewed guests. I think that might have been the James Clear one recently that yeah. came out. Mm. And Hughes want, and like you said, you were surrounded by love growing up, but that love and that wanting for you to be here and to be healthy mm. keeps coming through. How does yeah, it feel yeah. to you hearing that? Oh, it's pretty, it's a bit overwhelming, actually. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. I mean, as I've said, the love, coming from my siblings and my family is pretty intense. I'm extremely lucky to have that kind of love. But that it's also overwhelming because it takes you into a place of, uh, yeah, I think the, the uh, dying and leaving other people, the dying part I'm working really hard to come to terms with. The Already I feel like it's something I should deal with pretty early in life because I think it'll lead to a much better life. And here I am plugging our show again, but we've got an episode coming out this year with Bronnie Ware, oh, who is the I author love of Bronnie's work. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, which was a really profound episode where we go into this a little bit. And I might have said this in the show, but there's a, a quote from one of my favorite writers, Christopher Hitchens, who says when his first child was born, he said it was like he saw the the funeral director at his funeral walking onto the stage, sort of saying, You're next. And I felt something very similar when Charlie was born, but not in a, 
not in a terrifying way. It was in a really healing, soothing way. Um, a you're next in a like a very caring, loving way, but also the effect it had is that it helped me with that voice as well of going, okay, well, I, and there's a lyric in a song about this that I don't have much time, which was misinterpreted by some people I know who thought I was sick, unfortunately, oh, <laughs> which I didn't mean. <laughs> I didn't mean for that to come across, but it's more that I don't have much time left and I don't want to waste any of it thinking that I'm thinking negative thoughts about myself. And so this this is a roundabout way of saying, yes, Hugh's concerned for my health. Yeah. Yeah. It's overwhelming because it's a hard thing to tackle because I've always, I've never been great at diet and exercise or the things that will prolong your life. So it's hard to hear it laced in those terms because it feels like, how could you not do it if someone loves you and cares about you that much but i've also got kids and a wife who i i would think don't want to don't want to rock you here, but i reckon they might even love me more <laughs> so i think I, I owe it to them just as much to get fit and it's something i really want to do is to get healthier but it's also really tricky when you've got a two-year-old who doesn't sleep and you know time poor and it's it's difficult so even though i feel like i might have the mental capacity to treat my body with a bit more care and respect. The time and energy just isn't quite there at the moment, but I'm yeah. looking forward to it maybe one day. Yeah. I think there's also those chapters of life that we have. And sometimes, and like I said to you, my kids are a lot older than yours. And yeah. it took to them to be that kind of five to six years old to be like, oh, now I can breathe a little bit easier. There's more capacity. Mm. They need me, but they don't need me as much. And then it's this next yeah. stage now. And I'm like, oh gosh, I can train every day. I couldn't do that when they were younger. Like, I don't know how people do that when they're younger. Like yeah, it's just a hats off to them that Nuts. my energy was put into somewhere else. And, and like you said, that lack of sleep. But I think that's that compassion that we've got to have as parents sometimes to be like, mm. we actually can't do it all. I mean, especially when you're no. working and you're running around doing all the different things. And oh, it's so hard. It's, I think it's not spoken about enough because there's so much pressure yeah. to be able to do it all. Uh, I think it's not mentioned enough to like give yourself a break on certain aspects of yeah. your life when you when you're raising kids, I'm certainly bad at that. I put a lot of pressure on many parts of my life. But on the good days, I'm able to remind myself. So it's just like, you've got to be going on. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think with anything, like, like he is one of those people that is able to maintain this incredible exercise regime whilst having three kids. But I think that's because it's something he loved to do before having kids. Yeah. So it's his happy time. Whereas at the moment, I think like, Playing music is my happy time, but I don't have time for that either. Like I, I play music to prepare for these live shows, but I haven't been able to write anything since then. I've got a few ideas of things that I'd love to pursue and try and write more music. And it was such a, it's an incredible opportunity to release music to people who might want to listen to it at the moment, but it's a timely thing, time, time consuming thing. And I, I don't really have the time to sit there for three or four hours and see what happens because Priorities. yeah because I, I also i care too much about being a i don't want this to come around the, i don't want this to come out the wrong way for other people but for me personally i care so much about being a present dad and a good partner that i don't want to take away from that by writing music by myself which is kind of a, a paradox because i feel like it's the first time in my life where i have something to say but I don't think now's the time to say, it. but maybe it will be in a, when one of them starts sleeping better. Yeah. Who knows? I think it's really beautiful actually hearing that from, again, from a man that values around family and commitment. Mm. Good, good friend of mine who recently single said to me, how do we find more emotionally available free people just like men like you out there? Because this is kind of what I'd want to see more of. Like, I'll check in with Josh and find out how do we create I know one. <laughs> I know a single one, actually. He's a great guy. Great. We'll hook them up later. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah, definitely. Cross the ditch. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> but that's kind of the beauty of what I feel like, and we haven't even talked about the perfect. So if anybody is willing to hear what you guys do, that the collaboration and the team and that you have, and what the whole process of the imperfects is a quite a unique unique product and unique podcast to be listening to. And I think that comes from the three of you. And so if people haven't listened to it. I really recommend actually jumping on and starting at the beginning because there's actually so much to take in hearing the development of all three of you along this way. Mm -hmm. And I think there's one thing that I remember listening to. It's maybe probably that was like 
few months into it where you would be like, I don't know if I'm supposed to be in this room. I don't know if I'm mm-hmm. supposed to be in this podcast with these two exceptional humans, Ryan with his background, with everything, can your brother mm-hmm. Hugh, with all those layers. How do you feel about that now? All these years now on the track? It's no, I, I, um, I think I feel like I should be there now. It took a long time, but I certainly, I really didn't feel like it. And it was a wavering thing. Like some days I'd feel, but it was very much performance based. I felt like if I felt like I contributed to an interview, I'd be like, oh no, you are deserving of being here. But if for whatever reason I wasn't able to contribute much to an interview, it would be like, oh yeah, see, this is proof that you shouldn't be here. And you fluked it last time. But I think now I've gotten to a point where I realized that we can't always be great every time we do something and just because you might have an off day doesn't mean you don't shouldn't be there and also i'm really lucky to have the team we've got i should also add to that bridget Bridget, who is just incredible and so much of the personality of the show more than the personality but she really is the fourth leg of that, that table that creates the feeling and the the themes and the episodes and we've also got an incredible editor, George and Jam, who edit episodes and work on stuff with us and Dr. M as well, who's just a phenomenon. Yes. But as far as creating the sort of DNA of the show, it's very much the four of us. But I'm lucky that it's such an incredibly supportive, open, it's the best working relationship I've ever had. It's incredible. I think the openness that you hear on the show, we've made sure that we have taken off the, off the mics as well. So everything is very caring and open and there's nothing you can really not say if you're feeling certain things, it's better set out with a, with compassion and care and dealt with, with compassion and care, sorry, which makes for an incredible group to work with. They're really, yeah, my closest friends. That sounds bad because I've got other friends who are just as close, but they're in, we're all really close friends as well, which is really special. To you be covered yourself that. there. You covered yourself. You've got lots of friends. Yeah. Yeah. Not that many, but. They're all, uh, yeah, <laughs> They're really I've got others that are as close, if not closer, that I don't want to feel like I'm pushing <laughs> away from that statement. There's an analogy that Hamish Blake said on our show that worked for me with this, which I think people should take into anything that they feel like they shouldn't be there. Because I said to him, I feel like I'm only on this show because I'm Hugh's brother. And he said, well, who cares? And he's like, so I'm going to paraphrase it. He did it better than me. But. He's like, you're here and you're doing the job. And from an objective, just like watching it as it's happening, you don't seem like you shouldn't be here. You are contributing the way you're meant to contribute. And you saying that you're, you're only here because your huge brother is like someone saying, seeing a car crash and walking past, seeing a car crash and saving someone's life. And people saying, well, you're not a hero. You just want to be walking past. Yeah. Which is such a great analogy for imposter syndrome, I think. It is. He had a great yeah. episode with you. And I think that's a big thing with so many people struggling with imposter syndrome. Hearing it from, from people that have shown up in such a brave way is it's really powerful. Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. My last question for you, though, mm. is around bravery. And when we I messaged you earlier, you were like, well, I don't think I'm brave. I'm like, yeah. Mm. What do you think bravery is then? I really should have known. I should have known this question. Come, come and consider it. You sent me the question if I think I'm brave. So I'm not sure I have a great answer for it because I, I think I would take issue at a sort of traditional definition of bravery, which to me, I, I think probably as a male growing up in sort of inhaling the idea of bravery there, I have issue with, which is a very sort of macho bravery, yep. which I don't necessarily identify with or think is very useful or valuable. So thinking of times where I've been brave. I think I always think of other people who are braver and deal with a lot tougher, harder things every day and and are able to still hold on to who they are throughout all that. Being able to hold on to the person that you are and the best version of yourself through difficulty and when you don't know what the outcome's going to be, maybe that is somewhat brave. That feels lovely. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's it, but it's something. (laughs) Kind of full circle for what we've been talking about today. An imperfect chat about how we grow through life and how we yeah. have challenges and definitely the, the ways that you step into it. And I think you've been a role model in so many ways for men out there and women. And I haven't even mm. talked about there's so many bits I would want to talk to you about. You've been doing some really brave things actually on the podcast. I would have said even with the recent chat about men and 
like hat off to you that the way that you are stepping into things that are uncomfortable, please keep doing it. Please keep oh, well, doing it. People are listening. Well. And it is amazing to sort of see that kind of ripple effect out. And that's the mm. kind of leadership that we need in, in the world. So thank you, Josh, for jumping on. Oh, thank you. You've used a lot of words I don't identify yes. myself as, but I'm very flattered. And yeah, we, there's no plan in stopping anytime soon. Amazing. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Ben. Great. Thank you for tuning in to the Bravery Academy. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And if you're looking to take your support for the podcast to the next level, visit patreon.com forward slash the Bravery Academy to access exclusive content and get early access to our upcoming episodes. Your feedback means the world to us. So please take a moment to give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you for being part of the Bravery Academy community. Stay brave, stay curious, and keep challenging yourself to grow. Until next time.